So please, in you go. Welcome. Do you have like a, a role model, someone you, you aspire to be? I, I, there's something I've been thinking about um, uh, a lot, um, and the answer is no. I, I, I have role models in different aspects of my life. Uh, you know, for example, for some cases, I would say that my father would be a role model. For some other cases, you see this uh, super successful entrepreneur that might be a really a role model. We all think about. Some of them, like Bezos or some yeah. of these guys. So, uh, but not. I think it's quite difficult to find some someone that is like perfect for you in all in all the cases. That's that's a really good answer. <laughs> uh, and give me give me a little bit of, of context. Uh, you were born and raised in the north north part of Spain, and and then what? What happened next? Where were you? Well, actually, I was born in the north, but I've never been I've never been living there. Okay. I, I, I live in Madrid almost all my, of my life. Um, at some point I had to move to the south of Spain for, for four years, but then okay. I, I went back to Madrid to the university. Uh, when I finished university, I started in, in PwC as a consultant, okay. and I spent uh, two years and a half there until I, I decided to quit and start my, my first startup. Was Don't run. Uh, we are going to get there. <laughs> but. but <laughs> Uh, give us, I don't know, how many consultants we have or aspiring co consultants we have in the room? I know no that. one? <laughs> one, two or three, yes. Uh, so could you, could you tell us a little bit about that experience, a, a few take-ons on, on being a consultant and well, in a PwC, you know, it's, it's a big company. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great school. It's a, you, you learn a lot on, on business, you learn a lot how to, actually, they, they what they... Um, teach you, or at least what they, they taught me, is that um, it's hard working. Uh, I was I'm quite lazy, I would say, and uh, they they there I experienced what what it takes, you know, to to finish a project and have to be there for long hours and during the night and weekends and so on. So that's something that um, I, I took for myself and. Uh, they, they teach you also some, some tools on how to manage and how to uh, value companies and, and process in, within companies, which is very good. Okay. So, um, but I have to say that I wasn't really good at my job. So yeah. I was, uh, yeah, I, I spent two years because that, that was uh, the most I could, I could handle it. I, it's, I, it's a tough job. I have to say that I was a bit of a consultant before. So I don't have to go to the office next morning. So probably <laughs> you have something there. If you want to start a company, start working at, as a consultant for yeah, a firm, and then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's you decided to, to move on, and, and, and you, you said, well, let, let's start something. And you joined uh, Jose, which, by the way, was one of our first speakers. Well, no, it was two years ago. Um, and you decided to start something that, that was end up being really good. Yeah. How was that process uh, from consultant to entrepreneur? Well, we spent one year um, uh, working as a consultant while um, we were uh, thinking about building this. Uh, okay. At the beginning, it's just uh, uh, wishful thinking. You just, you know, you, you, you uh, just imagine what it would be and, and what would you do. And then uh, we started to see that just in the UK started to move to Spain. So we, we then had to had to press the crawl and go a bit faster. So we went to the to for a, for a weekend to London and we started to test what just it was was like and, and their process and so on and so on and we and we saw there was uh, it was huge there. I mean all the restaurants were in just it. All everybody knew just it. It was on the TV. It was on, on, on the bus. It wasn't you know so 
Yeah. I think in that moment we realized that it was actually a good idea. Like it, it could be a good business. Okay. Um, so that's when we went, we came back and we, we decided that we were going to, we are going for it, so we quit. I love that, that part of the story because sometimes as entrepreneurs we think, okay, we have to have that precious idea that nobody is going to have out there. And you were and actually tested the idea before starting up <laughs> your company here in Spain. That, that, that is but quite cool. I would say that the first time we, we came with the idea, it was, it was Jose's idea. Um, we thought that we were the, the only one. I mean, we, we, actually, at a certain point, uh, one of our uh, investors told us, hey, you, you should you know, share the idea with more people in order to get feedback. Yeah. We were like, no, 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 this, this idea is it's, it's awesome. <laughs> nobody nobody can, can have it, you know? They, they are going to steal it from us. And then, like, two months later, you you just realize that there's, there's a guy in the UK that has been doing this for nine years, and there's a guy in the United States that has been doing this for ten years, so the, the idea is actually worthless. Yeah, I mean, maybe not worthless, but it's like you you feel that your idea is unique yeah. until you Google that, <laughs> and then you realize, well, it, you know, there. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna give it another try. So at at that point, it was really hard because you, I, I'm guessing, but you were working as a consultant in a very time demanding job, and also playing around with that idea. Yep. And. <laughs> I think I learned something about myself in that point. Okay. Um, because my partner Jose, he was very good at that. He he could work a lot during the day on his on his daily job, and then go at night and work at, at the project. And I realized, or I, I learned from myself that I cannot do that. I have to be on one thing and only one thing. And actually, sometimes one thing is too much. So it's uh, I gotta focus on on just doing. You know, uh, the moment you start thinking about two things, I I get lost. So I. So we had some, some early fights at the beginning because of that. Uh, because I was like, I cannot do my job, daily job, good if I'm focusing on this, and the other way around. So, and I was, I was the one that was going to quit uh, first in order to just be 100% fo um, focused on that. But when, came, when just it came to Spain, we, we just said it was, it was our time, so we, we both quit the same time. Yeah. So it, it, that, that kind of yeah. take on on the entrepreneur's experiences it's, it's really good to, to know. I mean, if, if you are struggling with something as, okay, I have to do this, but I don't know how, like handling or, or dealing with two different things, uh, it happens. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not weird at all. You are not a weird entrepreneur. You, you, are, you are feeling and having the same sort of uh, approach to. Uh, could, you, could you, or would you say that whatever happened with La Nevera Roja, uh, shaped you as an entrepreneur for the future. Totally, uh, it was it was amazing. The the um, so how much we we learn from that, but you don't realize until you stop. You know, and you, you, just, you just like you get one step back and have a look at what you've done and have you done it and all the mistakes that you that you've done in, in these four years. So you you then start learning, actually really learning, and then you talk to other entrepreneurs. Uh, when we sold the company, I had some conversations with other, with other entrepreneurs and I was a bit depressed because I saw the company that I, um, we knew that we made some mistakes, and really, really uh, big mistakes that we would love to have, have it done better, you know? So you start yeah. to share that with other entrepreneurs and you realize that everybody's done exactly the same mistakes and have done exactly through the same process and the same depressions and so on. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's somehow you just feel better with yourself and you, you forgive yourself <laughs> and, uh, and you start learning and, and it was amazing. So there are many things that I'm doing right now in my startup that I, so many mistakes that I'm not, that I'm not making right now. Yeah. Thanks to all that experience, um, I'm making others for sure, but not the same. Uh, let, let me rephrase all this because this, this is actually kind of a perfect excuse to plan for exit your company. If you want to really learn, you have to <laughs> solve the fucking thing, you know? It's, it's, it's not gonna, the, 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 the knowledge is not gonna come just, just for you being around. Uh, so let's go like with three, four questions about La Nevera Roja, but really, really quick. Sure. Uh, do you have in mind what, what was your biggest operational challenge? Mm. It was 
always about about managing people. Okay. Always. So we started with uh, a lot of interns, and uh, well, we had no money, so we, we had to have uh, really cheap people, so no ex unexperienced people, uh, interns, and so on. And uh, it was a, it was a huge challenge. Actually, I, I I can tell you right now, it's much cheaper and much easier to have to have at the beginning uh, experienced people and, and uh, senior guys. Yeah. It's much easy much easier to handle them or at least communicate with them and uh, you know that you can you can go and work on another thing and you know anything that you delegated to them it's is gonna going to deliver. Be yeah. Maybe not the perfect way, maybe not the way you want it, but, it, but at least it's going to go forward. <laughs> with interns, it's, uh, well, I mean, it's not their fault. It's, it's, it's just, how do you have, we, we used to say that the spam, the control spam that you have to have with them is one to one. Yeah. So you have, you have one guy, you have, you have one intern, that's, that's it, because you have to tell <laughs> exactly what to do step by step. You know? that's, that's really tough. I yeah. mean, you cannot multiply yourself if you, if you have to have exactly. more than one. Exactly. And going on, on top of that, back then when you, have your, when you were building that team based on, as, as I understood, based on interns, uh, what would you say to them to actually get things done? How do you encourage them to? At the, at the beginning, we thought that it was as easy as telling them what we thought. Like, okay, let's call restaurants and bring them to the platform. That's it. I mean, it's easy, isn't it? I just call them and bring them to the platform. That's it. But then you, and so then you just, just go and, and go back, come back, and, and we hear what they're saying. It's like, no shit, no, no, we're not doing that. We're Shut not, up! We're not, stop doing that. Not, so then, so what you realize is that uh, you either get senior guys and let them do what they want, and just trust them and, and coach them, or you get junior guys and you have to tell them exactly what to do. Then creating processes gets super important. Yeah. And, and even if you get senior guys, the moment you want to scale a team, having really good processes and tested processes and everything written that everybody knows exactly what to do and uh, making everybody collaborate, it's, uh, it's probably the toughest and most important task for us here. That's a, a really good take on. Uh, going a little bit backwards, at the beginning when you were starting, how important having supportive family and friends uh, was back then? I mean, it... well, well, I mean, in, in while we were in La Neveda Roja, yeah. super, super important. Um, actually, I, I think I wouldn't have uh, the success that we had Without, without our, uh, in that, in that, but the, so back then it was my girlfriend, but now my wife and uh, Jose, uh, his wife again. Yeah. It's super important because you have you, you work super long hours. You are stressed all day long. You have no money at all, so you cannot do anything. You cannot go on vacation. You cannot go have dinner. You, I mean, your life sucks a little bit. You know, <laughs> so. You need someone that supports you, and that it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm waiting for you to tell me what, what's the enjoyable part of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> I mean, it's. When you sell it. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, no, no. another excuse to no, exit no, no, your company. No, no, no. <laughs> no. no it's. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great journey, uh, but it's but it's uh, tough. You know, it's just it's it's tough. So you need support. Uh, so whenever you have that support, it, it things get easier. Yes. Yeah. And. Um, um, going around the, the idea of, of raising your the funds you need because you, you have to you have a payroll you have to pay uh, fees and maybe taxes or whatever uh, where do you get the, the, the seed money so at the beginning we we got the money from ourselves so we invested our our savings um, then we got money from friends and family okay. uh, the first round and after that um, we were not growing very fast that we were good and we had a platform that was that was working. Uh, so we went to we went to capital market that in 2011 it was quite narrow I would say. It's uh, in Spain you, you didn't have really venture capital and all the venture capital that we had was was specialized in the Spanish market. So they they wouldn't push you to go outside. They wouldn't help you really in in. Um, hiring good people, and you know, the, the mindset was totally different than, than it is right now. Um, so we, we spoke with all of them, and we got rejected by all of them. So no one wanted to invest. And one day we found a, a, a 
bank, it's Kaisa Bank, yeah. that they have a, a small venture capital uh, arm that they do convertible notes. Okay. And we, we talked to them and, and uh, managed to, I don't know why, but they, they decided they were, they were going to take the risk. So they invested 100000 uh, on a convertible note, and that was the first institutional investment that we had. And from that point, it got a bit easier because you can, you can, you know, in your deck, you can introduce a stamp of someone knowledgeable in, instead of having, you know, your dad and your uncle. Which, yeah. You know, doesn't sound really professional. Uh, and so, in in any case, we, we went back some months, uh, some months after to we went back to the market you not know, to raise more funds because we were growing good. Um, and again, it, we get, we got rejected by everyone except for ENISA, which is public public funding. Yep. So we then had to go to friends and family again, and uh, yeah, we were we were getting most of the funding from friends and family until 2013, where we were actually quite good and growing very fast, okay. in which we got our first uh, institutional investor. Okay. And moving like a, a little bit fast forward, media for equity, would you do it again? Yeah, definitely. Um, but you have, you know, I think we were the first success story of, uh, of media for equity in Spain. Yeah. I think so. Because I've, I've known many, um, uh, many people that have done media for equity and it wasn't really successful. Actually, they thought that it, it was a bad deal. Uh, and the, the secret was that we had a, one of our board members come from media. Okay. And he, he helped us you know, understand what's a good deal and what's a bad deal. And, and uh, thanks, thanks, to, thanks to his advice, we could do a really good deal in Media for Equity. Um, so we got the money. Actually, we didn't, instead of having, you know, uh, like uh, a debt with, with the media, what we, what you get is actually money yeah. on the bank account, then you start paying them. So you have the bargaining power, yeah. uh, which is one of the best advice that we've got to do Media for Equity. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we started to grow. I mean, we, we went from being 60% the size of our competitor to be the same and the same size yeah. in four to five months, thanks to thanks to television. So it was very good. Okay. And last but not least, about La Nevera Roja, and we are not, we are not going to talk about uh, La Nevera Roja anymore till the networking part. No but what's the exit strategy somehow planned? From the very beginning, it wasn't. It wasn't a strategy. I mean, it wasn't planned. It just happened. Okay. Um, we, when we started to invest in television, we became as big as our competitors. We were 50-50. Um, there was a consolidation movement within within the uh, within Europe. Yeah. Uh, so the three big players were trying to acquire and, and consolidate the markets. Um, just was one of them. So they 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 once they, they one day they say, hey, we, we might want to acquire you, and then came a German one, and say, and then another German one, you know, and they started to be, and, the, and, and in like in three weeks, the the price of the rock, and we we sold it. Awesome. But it was it was a great deal, but uh, it wasn't planned. I have to say. Yeah, mo most exits are not exactly planned from the beginning, and that's that's important. No, you you are not working on your company just because you want to sell it oh, no, at a no. higher price. Uh, so uh, let's, let's talk about now about OnTruck. Could you explain what OnTruck is? Yeah, it's a, it's a marketplace that connects um, truckers with companies to do the, the delivery of pallets. Okay. So before you say it, uh, I would say it's like Uber for trucks. Um, many people say that, but Uber has got its own Uber for trucks, so it's yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> kind of now, uh, yeah. Uh, how many founders you you are in the team? We're five. Five people. Five yeah. Okay. And how was that decision to 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 put together like a team of five and say, well, we are we all are going to be founders? Uh, it was it like okay? You decide that like carefully. You prepare for that. Yeah. We okay. so in in. I met one of the co-founders in uh, like November 2015, and he's he's an insider. Okay. So he knows what the problems are to track industry, to track this, and uh, how fragmented it is, the intermediation, and so on. So he's, he came with the idea. He's really he's a junior guy. Uh, he's 
really, really intelligent, but he has no experience, and he came to me and explained me the idea, and we started to talk, and, well, we, we decided it might be a good idea. We started the, the, the market and the industry for at least three months, okay. and in January 2016 is when we decided that, yeah, we should go for it. So at that point, I knew that uh, having really good partners and, um, and senior guys at the very beginning was key. So I started to um, uh, search for three co-founders, one for product, one for option sales, and one for tech. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, we, in, in two months and a half, I think, I, I, I got them on board and uh, we started the, the project. I know the next is going to be kind of a silly question, but <clears throat> why bring them on board as co-founders and not just uh, hire them? Because you cannot hire uh, such a great guys. We have a CTO or, or CEO, or C, uh, COO right now. Um, I mean, they are really senior guys. They they want to get involved in, in in a project. And actually, for me, it's much better. I mean, I feel more comfortable if they. Yeah. I have the the key positions are are you know partners and, and not just employees. Um, they feel more engaged. I feel better, and it's a uh, yeah. And it's also a matter of uh, uh, ownership. Yep. You want to give ownership to, to your, you know, core team. It's like, I, I used to use this as, imagine your business is like a pizza, and you know that at least one of the pepperoni slices is yours. Uh, you're going to eat it a little bit better. You know, it's it's going <laughs> to taste a little bit better. Okay, um, let's, let's talk a bit about the, the interest industry you you. you just appear in, and you, you already mentioned you were not sort of involved with what was happening about that, that industry, but uh, I guess you have learned a lot about, I don't know, how big is that market, how, how you sort of uh, identify the opportunity, uh, how you move forward uh, regarding the, the, the whole industry, not just in Spain, but in, in Europe. How do you do all that? How, how was that path? Well, for that, it was super useful being a, an entrepreneur in my past life, because uh, being, sorry, and, and a consultant in my past life, because I mainly what I did is just just study the market as, as I used to do when I was a consultant, and um, I well, we we start uh, studying some uh, doing some analysis, and then we realize first of all, it's it's six percent between five and seven percent of the European GDP, okay. so it's a huge market. Um, most of the trackers are owner operators and dependent trackers, so it's uh, it's uh, it's highly fragmented. Um, technology haven't changed any process in the last 50 years, which means that it's uh, there's a huge opportunity. It, there's, it's highly inefficient. So, actually, at the beginning, I couldn't believe that it was it, it worked the way it was. So I, I, I started talk with with uh, with uh, trackers and, and companies, and not understand how they manage to to you know to uh, much supply and demand. And start to, to talk with a, a company that told me, hey, what we do is we have a list on paper of trackers, and we have shipments, we call them, and you know, one of them would tell me that they would do it. Um, and what's the price? Well, I have to figure out. I mean, they tell me and we negotiate, and sometimes because I've done a favor to him past week, then he, you know, yeah. he, he does me a favor and it's cheaper and so on. And, how long does it take for you to match that shipment with the tracker? Like, you know, several hours, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you just call them. So it was amazing. And then you, you go to the tracker and say, so you receive this shipment, what do you do? Well, it depends. If I can do it, I do it. If not, I will call my friend that can do it, and I will sell it with a discount, and I will get 10%. Okay. So how many times that can happen? <laughs> I don't know, five, seven? Oh, holy really? shit. So there's seven intermediaries in, in one shipment that are taking a small take rate. You know, and the guy that is that is doing at the end is screwed. You know, because they, I mean, the one is going to pay 30 years, uh, 30 days on, of delay, and to the second one, the second one is going to, I don't know, increase at 10 more days. Third one, for, so the last one is getting paid 90 days of delay, and and is getting paid only fraction, and it, you know, and and as a user, you get mad when your <laughs> package doesn't arrive like day one. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's it's insane. Was, was that a reality just here in Spain, like every, yeah, everything yeah. done in, in paper? But yeah. how about Europe? It's, it's exactly the same. Oh, shit. It's exactly the same. And in the United States, it's even worse. Because it, it's... So the more fragmented market, the, the, the more um, 
inefficiencies. Okay. Uh, and the most fragmented market in the world is the United States. So it's amazing. It's uh, and that's why it makes all the sense to have a Uber Freight or Convoy on our competitors. And that makes a lot of sense. That yeah. that is actually a, a good way to hunt for ideas for your products, for your projects, for whatever you're you're studying. Just I don't know what's happening. Uh, I didn't break anything. <laughs> what did they say? It's okay. Good. Uh, so you, you just start looking on whatever industry and, and try to figure out where the inefficiencies are. Yeah. Would you look at people lined up just because? Well, there's an opportunity. That's that's a good thing. Um, how do you monetize this? How do you how do you actually make it? work business wise um, so we, we get money from the so we get paid uh, full amount of the shipment and then we pay the carrier for, for the shipment we get a take rate but the reality is that um, uh, it's not easy to get positive margin in this market you have to be efficient so the way we um, get post margin is by uh, optimizing the, the utilization of the truck so we yeah. make sure that they are um, they don't have any legs or they do the, the less amount of empty kilometers possible. Yeah. So in order to have them uh, moving all the time full, so trying to optimize this. That's good. Optimize it. So you are basically, uh, like rephrasing this, is if they have like half truck empty or if they go, I don't know, Madrid to Barcelona and they have to go back without any cargo, you try to fill that cargo back so they well, actually optimize this. It's not actually, I mean, that's, uh, that's where we sell it sometimes, but it's not actually that's not it. It's more like I have a truck and I have a shipment that is from here to Barcelona. Okay. And I have to make sure that I have a shipment from Barcelona to Madrid so that that truck has a full, you know. So I, I just, I optimize routes. What I, what we do is get shipments, get trackers, and try to optimize routes. Is that? Um, I, I'm thinking on geography. Is that making sense when you are <clears throat> between cities that are? close apart, but I mean, my, my question is, is, is still making sense if you are, I don't know, Madrid to Berlin? Well, it makes more sense if okay. it's Madrid to Berlin. Actually, the, the average empty shipments on the market uh, for long hauling, like for, for international, it's less than, than 15%. Uh, oh. I mean, but the shorter the distance, the higher the inefficiency. So if you go to our, our focus right now is short hauling. So we do uh, regional transportation okay. uh, surrounding big urban areas like Madrid, Barcelona, London. Um, and in those cases, um, empty legs are, are around 40%. Okay. So they run empty 40% of the time. So because it's it's more difficult to generate efficiencies in short hauling. I mean, long hauling, if you go to Berlin, you're not going to move from Berlin and there's half a shipment <laughs> because it's thousands of euros. You know? yeah. so you, you, you you find it. You just find it. You find short holes that you know bring you back to, to Spain. Okay. But in short holing, you just go. You just have to accept everything because you don't know, and they appear on the spot. It's not like you have a straight line from Madrid to Berlin. There's a straight line. Yeah. But if you go within Madrid, there are many ways in, in which you can move. So okay. you generate know, the that is just more complex. So it's, it's it's not a simple kind of business. You have to. No, no, no. You have to be like a, as a platform, like in the middle of a lot of variables, a lot of things you have to deal with, uh, not just the, the one that wants to send the, the cargo, but also dealing with truck drivers and whatever is happening with them and their schedules and, and all that. Uh, from, from the technology standpoint, what have you done so far in that landscape? We, there are two main pieces of technology that we have, we have developed that are uh, key. Our market. One is the it's the pricing engine, so we give instant pricing and the, and it's dynamic or kind of dynamic. So it changes depending on, on some variables and it changes depending on, on seasonality. Okay. Uh, and the other one is the routing algorithm. So we have an algorithm that runs every hour in order to match uh, shipments and and uh, it suggests routes to the fleet manager um, and it starts to work very well. So the idea is that one day it will be 100% automated. And uh, yes, the algorithm is the one that is dispatching. Uh, right now, we, we are in the process of building. Okay. And I was wondering, when I was learning about the company, I was wondering, 
at a more operational sense, uh, you don't even have warehouses, you don't, you don't deal with any cargo whatsoever. Uh, are the truck drivers or were the truck drivers at the beginning like, you know, okay, I'm willing to try this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna download an app, I'm gonna let the, the other guy that is sending the, the shipment just pay them and then they are gonna pay me. It was an easy sort of road with them. Um, no, it's not. And uh, at the beginning, it, so every, every new city that we open, acquiring supply, it's, it's probably the toughest part um, because they don't trust you. And, it's, and I, I understand it. So it's all about building a, a good value proposition. If you have a value proposition that is much better than what they have, then you're incentivizing them to, to try, at least try, and see. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to do three shipments and let's see what happens. So we work a lot on the value proposition. What can we offer them? Uh, apart from tr from shipments, yeah. um, that would would get them incentivized to to try with us and say no to some of their current clients. Which yeah. is, I mean, that's the trade-off. If they say yes to me, they are going to say no to a current client that is paying them every month. So um, it's not easy. But the moment you, you you figure out the value proposition, and we we can say that we more or less <coughs> figure it out. Um, acquiring the supplies and that is not that difficult because. You start with, the, with a few of them, and they, they see that, that you treat them well, that you pay them well, that they actually do shipments, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so they start to spread the word. You know? yeah. and, and word of mouth here works amazingly. What are your growth rates right now? 30% on average, month for month. Okay, that, that's quite impressive. And uh, in, uh, in, in the other side of the platform, uh, all, all those small companies willing to send things, are they too different or they behave too different with, between cities? Like in Madrid is somehow different than in London, for instance? Do you have to approach to them in a different way? No, what, what we saw is that it's, it's more different the, the, the way we have to acquire the supply than okay. the demand. The demand okay. is quite similar in everybody. And because, I mean, companies, they behave the same, they have more or less the same problems, more or less the same processes. Uh, we also we focus to uh, meet to big companies and enterprises, okay. and they are pretty much the same all over the world. Yeah. And they behave pretty much the same. I mean, they have super standardized ways of working. So in that case, it's quite it's quite similar. Um, on the other hand, acquiring supply is not similar in, in every country because you find different dynamics. So for example, in London, there's a huge shortage of, of trackers. Yeah. So you have to change the value proposition because there are not enough trackers for all the shipments that are in London. So so you have to be much better than your competitors so that they are willing to work with you instead of a competitor. And that that dynamic is much different than Spain or in Madrid where we have oversupply. So there's yeah. no problem in getting trackers quite easy. Actually. That's that's I guess it's kind of challenging because uh, as far as I am getting at this, you are sort of twisting a little bit your business model in itself. Yeah. Uh, city by city. Yes. Yeah, you have to adapt yourself. Yeah. To it's kind of challenging. Reality. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about the, the funding part. How do you actually pay for all of this? And uh, at a very basic level, without going into many details, I want to learn firsthand how was that first round when you when you have to raise your first round, the seed round. Uh, what was the process you followed? Well. Um, I have to say that it's, so first of all, my, um, being a, a previous entrepreneur and having a, a success uh, make, made things much easier. Okay. Okay. So in my first startup, we got rejected by every VC that we visited. Uh, and then same person, same guy, goes to visit those same VCs you know, for a different startup four years later. And everybody's keen to invest. Okay. So it, <laughs> this is it would be unfair to say that you know I, I what I did because it's not replicable. It just happens that right now by 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 the circumstances it, it got easier. Um, but also what what I did because it was easier. Then I, I uh, what I did it's uh, set up higher target. Yeah. So I wanted to have international VCs at the beginning, although we were we were only operating in Spain, uh, and I wanted the best. VC. So I, I had, had a clear view that the best VC in terms of marketplaces in Europe uh, for, for seed rounds is 0.9. Yeah. 
So I started to talk to them. It happens also that the uh, former CTO and, and former uh, uh, colleague in PwC yeah. was working in okay. Point Nine, so it made things a bit easier again. But but it was difficult to, to got them on board because they, they know you know they, they see so many um, so many projects every year and they, they decide on, on investing on, on a few of them. Yeah. Um, but you have to be I mean you, you have to work on it even even if you have a good success, no? a good success. Anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna just point it out again is exit your company if you have the, <laughs> the chance to do it exit it. Everything is gonna go smoothly afterwards. The second one, yeah. 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 I mean if Elon Musk just entered the room and said, I'm going to start selling t-shirts. <laughs> Who is not going to buy those t-shirts? I mean, how much money are you asking for? It's, 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 it's not that simple as that. I know, but, yeah, but yeah. it's... Yeah, but it gets easier. And also, what's, it gets easier to get to acquire um, uh, fun because it gets easier to acquire time. So I, 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 I could get my co-founders on board because I had a success and I could say, hey, I've been through this. And I yeah. know what it takes. So let's let's build something bigger and better, you know, but with the, with the experience that we have. Yeah. And because of that, when we go to, to a VC and the first question they have when you when it's uh, when it's your seed round, it's okay, what's the team? It's yeah. more it's it's like what's the addressable market and what's the team? Yeah. And that's mainly it. Um, and then you saw a team with a lot of pre you know, uh, uh, Serial entrepreneurs that that had some exit, not only me but my CEO, the CSO, the the BB product, and for them it's like it's a, it's an easier decision. It's like yeah. okay, these guys have gone through this, have, have gone through this several times before, and the addressable market is huge. So, however, that doesn't mean that your numbers doesn't have to actually make sense. No, exactly. But in the seed round, yeah. your numbers doesn't. Seem yeah, it's, it's just. Just proof. You have a, a small proof that, yeah, trackers want to download an app, and I can send them an app, a, a shipment. I accept it. Yeah. Okay. But what are you, what are you saying? I mean, Uber has been doing this for lots of years, and, and you know, so yeah. a million times a day. So <laughs> you're not really proving anything. It's just about the digital market. Um, and the team you have behind it. Yeah. I think. I, I mean, that's, that's my, my experience. I'm, that makes sense. We that... should ask. We should ask Jose, who is a venture capitalist right now. So yeah. What I, he I, thinks. I, I would love to ask him <laughs> about that. Um, to the other side of the, of the table. Yeah. Uh, probably he's going to tell you something similar, but with a different approach, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so then, after a lot of time, you went for a Series A, and, and you have now, um, I guess, the lead investor was... Uh, Atomico. It, Atomico, okay. Atomico yeah. was the lead investor there. And then you have, like, Five different uh, VCs, private equity uh, companies investing. How how's that relationship now? Well, very good. It's very friendly, and we and the funds that we have on board is, are super supportive. All of them, even the even the small ones. It's amazing how they they, they want to be as helpful as they can, and uh, they are always offering their services or the, at least their advice. And, um, it's pretty good, and the thing is that they. They co-invest in many, many startups. So yeah. Atomico with Tide Invest and uh, with Point Nine and with Semi Pattern. So on. They, they, all of them, they are. So they might be competitors in some cases, and some others, you know, they, yeah. they co-invest. So um, they, they have a good relationship with them. Uh, so it, it makes, for me, it makes things easier. So they know each other, and, and they talk not only my board but on other boards, and uh, they come with different ideas, and they talk between them. It's, uh, it's good. That is what it's healthy. What's called smart money. In the end, you, you have yeah. your investor helping you out exactly. uh, every step on the, on the way to success, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering when I, when I was looking around the, the round you to raise it, it wasn't published in July, I guess, but it was closed like in May. In May, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was how much? 10 million. 10 million. 10 million for Series A here in Spain is kind of a big deal. And uh, when you were dealing with all those term sheets, and this is probably a, an uncomfortable question, but um, do you have like a, a, a really crappy term sheet that you you hate a lot, like you, you couldn't handle it and, and, and you put that aside and you went to, I mean, you, you, did you have the chance to pick your investors? 
uh, um, based on their term sheets? More or less. Um, I, I do have the chance because I had I had some people that wanted to do best, but the medium for CSA was quite kind of crazy, uh, and the only ones that really uh, bought the hypothesis underneath were I'd invest first and then and then atomic. Actually, I'd invest help somehow to get atomic on board. But, but again, exactly the same as in as in the CDC, I had a clear idea of what what was the best. VC, and I wanted the best VCs on board. So I know that I invest the biggest uh, VC in France, and France is a, it's a natural market for us, so we will go to France eventually. Yeah. And uh, and Atomico, it's it's known as being the, the best VC in terms of helping entrepreneurs and in terms of size. So it made it made sense for us. Yeah. So the, we target those from the very beginning. That's good. So now when you are a serial entrepreneur, you know. Uh, what is the path? You know, wh what are the buttons you have to to press and, and where to go? And that, that's really good. And uh, I guess we are having like Mike when I do this. It's kind of weird. Um, if you if you were about to start another fundraising, imagine one of these guys that that, that is. Uh, fundraising now, or is about to start a fundraising for for their companies. What would you tell them? Well, you have to understand what what it takes to fundraise in every stage. Um, and VCs are not going to ask the same in Series C, Series A, and Series B. So you have to understand, you have to fulfill what they expect. Uh, so in order to do that, what I would suggest is talk to all the VCs that you can. Even if you get rejected, just talk to them. Just you learn a lot. Yeah. You understand their thinking. You, un you understand what they want, what, what they want, and you can go two months later and say, "Hey, we, we reached that, or we addressed whatever." Um, so, I would suggest that you, you talk with all the VCs. And the second thing that I would suggest, also, um, I would as an advice, and it's something that I've been suffering uh, because I'm 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 very optimistic. So I always want to go really fast and, and raise a lot of money and so on, and. Uh, but the reality is that we are in Europe. But we have a lot of news from fundraising in China and the United States. Yeah. Where things are different. So I guess one of the things that also we have to think is that um, we live in, in our context. So just, just um, don't get frustrated and adapt <laughs> to your context. And that's, that's actually a, a, an advice for myself. Yeah. And I have to repeat that for myself because I see my computer raising 60 million with some numbers, and I'm like, shit, we should be doing that. But, you know, in Europe, that things don't work the same. And I guess it somehow it's uh, uh, some sort of a vanity metric. You say, well, I have the bigger pile of money, you yeah, know. Exactly. Well, uh, probably you have most of that on the bank because you're not using it. And going on top of that, this round eight probably is, is too early to say, it, but um, how much oxygen is going to put on a truck? Uh, series B somehow plan in the near future? Well, it's not about the oxygen that's left. It's about how much you want to to grow and how prepared you are to grow. So okay. what we are doing with this 10 million is making sure that we are prepared to grow. And the moment we feel comfortable uh, in the board that we are prepared to grow, we will go for a, for a Series B. That's awesome. And uh, I you already are sort of, you, you were born here in, in Madrid, I guess. No, in Pamplona. In Pamplona, okay. Pamplona. okay. Uh, no, no, I mean the, the company, no, no, oh, the company. No, not yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the company was born here in Madrid. Okay. And then you moved to Barcelona, I guess, and then... Well, we opened in Madrid, and the office, the headquarters are in Madrid. Yeah. Uh, and we have offices in Madrid and London. Okay. We opened in Madrid, then Catalonia, then Valencia. Uh, we are about to open Galicia and Basque Country, and we opened in London. And uh, my question is over, over that office in London is, you are probably, from the outside the point of view, you are not spilling over already on, on the UK market, but you already have an office. You already have yeah. representation there. Uh, you have the shipments there, and we've grown quite fast. And, and that decision was made based on what you, you mentioned. Like, uh, we know we are going to grow. We know we are going to go as big as we can. And uh, why London? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, we, we focus on short honing, and London is the biggest standalone market. Okay. Germany is the biggest market 
in terms of shipments, but London as a city, as, a, as an area, it's, it's got more shipments. Uh, second, it's, it's language. We all, in the company, we all speak English, so it would be easier for us to start to do, do interviews and understand the market and, and talk to drivers and, and carriers. Okay. Uh, if it will be Germany, we'll have to have people uh, that speak German and we'll have to have translation or, or Paris will be French, you know? Yeah. But it, in, in English, which is, and, and third one is we, we don't have competence, so it made all sense to start the, um, our first uh, international test uh, in a place where we have competitors. Good, good. And uh, just, just briefly about your, your team, how many people you are right now? 65. Holy shit, yeah. 65 people, that's yeah. a lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are you hiring people? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. they are hiring, and, yeah. and it's good to know, you know. Yeah. And uh, they were telling me if they need like developers, we have a lot. <laughs> good. Uh, it's good oh, to know. To them. Okay. It's, it's good to know, and they they, they actually have uh, pretty much in every single startup, uh, they they have developers in, in whatever Cabify or uh, Wallapop or Deliver. They have their own. Uh, People that they, they, they are working there. Um, so let's let's move a little bit faster in this last part of the, the interview. And we are going sort of back on the on the personal side of you. As a founder, as a, as a serial entrepreneur, as a CEO of a company, is it possible to balance your personal life with your work life? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's. It gets tough sometimes, we have to travel, and sometimes you have to uh, be at the office long hours, but um, yeah, I try to do so. I mean, and actually, the moment you have a kid, um, things change a lot. So you, you, like, you force yourself to, to uh, balance it better. Yeah. And we, we had a speaker before here, he was one of our directors also, Klaus Rosenberg. Uh, he has been an entrepreneur for like 30 or so years. And he always claimed, well, there's no such a thing as balance. You can actually have a very good integration, which is kind of a different twist. And I say, well, I'm going to buy it, but you know. <laughs> no, uh, I guess what he means is that um, you don't stop working. Yeah. You know, your startup, it's, it's, on your, it's in your mind all the time. The problems don't go away. You, it's like you integrate the family. In your <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you are like in your laptop and you are with your kid there. This is the way it is. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross this on the hobby question. You don't have any hobbies. You should have a hobby right now. Uh, just, just wishful thinking. If, if you have the chance to actually have a hobby, what would that be? <laughs> well, you know, the usual thing say, I like to read and travel and, you know, those kind of things. <laughs> Go hiking. I have, I, I really like, I mean, I have hobbies and I, I like sports, but the problem is that I, I feel embarrassed when I say that I, that I like, for example, playing golf or skiing or playing football or whatever, because I don't have actually time to do it. So it's like, yeah, I, I would love to, to practice that hobby, but in, in reality, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't spend as much time as I, as I would like to. Those activities. Uh, this is this is one of my goals for the near future. I met a, a VC a while ago, and the guy told me, "Well, my partner and I, he's the CEO, and, and the partner is the CEO, kind of." And uh, he said, "Well, pretty much two or three days a week, my partner and I go to the highest peak on, on the Sierra de Guadarrama at 5 a.m. We actually sneak on, on on the place, and then we go down skiing." And at 9.30 a.m., we are at our office really? in Legacy. And it's, it's incredible because you start your day like with a sunrise at the top of a mountain. You feel the king of the world. And then you go down and start working. I said, well, that's good. That's good. Uh, and, and I, I have to say, it's, it's because I, I guess, because I'm a bit lazy, I have to say, and I like, I like a lot. I like to sleep. Um, <laughs> so, that's not being lazy. That's being human. Yeah. But, for example, also, when he was, when he was um, at La Navidad Rosa, he was preparing an an Iron Man, and he did an Iron Man. Oh, really? He, he wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning, and he came to the office having, I don't know, swam, swam like 
four kilometers and run 40 and you know and it's like when when do you do it and then he was he was quite good at 9 a.m. you know at the office with, it was fresh with, you know? exactly with and fresh and, and like, you know I just got a coffee I got, I got a bed and I got a coffee and I feel tired and this guy has been like swimming for three hours and it's it's fresh so it's I don't know it's I was telling to someone uh, before before we started that sleeping is overrated. You know, you, <laughs> you have to. No, I mean, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, on a personal or professional note, uh, and we are almost end with 2017. You have like a big goal for next year. Yeah, I would like to keep growing the company and. You mean from a startup point of view? <laughs> uh, either, either from the from the company point of view and for your personal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit sad that the first thing that comes to my mind is companies, right? Um, it's not sad. Yes. Yeah, I would say that uh, we actually this target we want we want to reach a uh, hundred million revenue in 2018. I'm going to write that down. hundred yeah. million revenue. It's talking in 12 months. Okay. Is that a is that a deal? Yeah. Can you can can you be here in a, in a year? Okay, let's do that. That's going to be fun. Uh, either way, eh? <laughs> either if you succeed or not. Uh, so really quickly, do you have like a, a tool that you use every day you cannot live without? And please, please, don't say email. Uh, what's up? <laughs> okay. okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I'm, I'm going to write that down. We have a, a small internal fight with the WhatsApp because we were using Slack. and it's Exactly. I mean, I, I would say also Slack. I mean... It's like it's, it's like and Tableau are the two tools that I use the most uh, for working. But then WhatsApp is okay. Um, you sort of mentioned this, but uh, do you have something to read to recommend, like a blog or apart from the Startup Brain blog, mm. which is really good? I, <laughs> it's the only one that I did. Awesome. Um, no. I wasn't expecting another one. <laughs> I, I read a lot of books, and uh, there are some good some, some books that are just Amazing. I'm, I'm finishing right now the hard things about hard things from Ben Horowitz, and it's it's it it makes me feel so comfortable that people it's been through those kind of you know through the same um, making the same mistakes and, and through the same process that you've been through that it's uh, it's it's good and you learn a lot. So well, um, I'm gonna send you an email right away with uh, we have Ben Horowitz on we have been probably. In every single global event in, in Silicon Valley since we started, and last year he was a keynote, and he was talking about cultural revolutions and how to actually make a cultural shift within companies. Mm -hmm. It is a, a kind of a weird, dense sort of keynote that is worth a shot. I'm gonna yes, I'm gonna send it to you. Um, sometime in the future, like ten years. Uh, when OnTruck is sold for two billion dollars or more, I don't know. Would you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. I, you know, I, I, I promised myself that this is the last one. Okay. Uh, but my wife, she doesn't do it. <laughs> so Where is your, your wife? I, Where is your wife? <laughs> I mean, if he, if he hits like. Two billion dollars is the last one. Can be the last one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, just final final thing. Uh, a piece of advice for entrepreneurs in, in the room. Um, I don't know. Actually, I would I would appreciate any question they have, and I would try to give a specific advice because giving advice is. That for is. The sake of it, it's, it that is even better. We are gonna okay. open up. Uh, the mic, just shout the question, and Inigo is going to answer to you. We're going to have a small Q&A. You said you repeated your job at uh, when you, you took a test and you said you have to take a mistake on the Yeah, obviously. We, we, I mean, we did that because we thought we could be the leaders in Spain, and we want It's a mix of confidence and ignorance. 
I would say. Because <laughs> at the beginning you think you can do it, and that obviously you're going to do it much better than just it because these British guys they don't they don't know a shit about Spain. And and building a web page is just hiring a, a one of these guys and you, you just build the web page and let me do the business. No? So. If you think that that's the plan, then, then you, you have a lot of confidence and a lot of ignorance that allows you to think that you can beat them easily. And it took us uh, four years and a lot of money to do that and a lot of effort and suffering. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think you need that kind of, you know, confidence in yourself and, and a bit of ignorance uh, uh, to do it. Yeah. If you start thinking about what it takes, maybe you don't do it. You say, so if you knew it from <laughs> from the beginning. No, I mean I had the chance to do it by myself in Antwerp. Um, no, I think having having the the, the right partner, it's uh, it's it's like a boost to the company. Okay. There are many differences, and the, the main one is that when you screw it with a, in a B2B, the impact is huge. So the service level, uh, the, the product changes, the process, all the processes and the Q&A, it must be, it must be um, stronger. you you got to focus more on that than just uh, acquiring. So in, in a B2C, what we, what we experience is that you can uh, create <coughs> crappy, uh, a crappy product, um, invest some marketing, start getting the first uh, users, and then analyze what they do and improve the product. That's something that, it's, that you, cannot, you shouldn't do it. You cannot do it in B2B, as easy at least. I mean, you have to show something that really works. You have to show something that it's, uh, that, that it's what they want. So. Um, the, the product development process is a bit longer. Um, you have to, it must be more robust. And in terms of, of uh, acquisition, uh, you have to focus more on, on service level. Okay. From the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I know there are several, several of them. Um, so the biggest, of, at least the first one that had a real, real impact. Um, at the beginning, we we did a, a, a business plan when we were at PwC. Um, so the business plan mainly said that we are go we were going to spend 300,000 euros, and that was all. And then we are going to be making millions. And we were so confident that that, that was the plan that was going to happen that we went to, to our friends and family and said, you know. We're going to sell 49% of the company. Because we know, I mean, we're going to get 51, and this is going to be a huge success, and we are going, so we're going to yes, sell 49. And um, we had some advice and say, hey, don't, don't do that, because you're going to keep raising money, because this is not going to happen with 300,000. And we had some argument between Jose and I, and at the end we didn't, we didn't that, but we, we gave a, quite a huge stake. And, I think that's, that, that would be the biggest mistake, that you, you just do a business plan and you, 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 know, you, you are so confident that it's going to happen without testing, actually testing it, and doing what, what they call an MVP. So what I've learned is that uh, every time I start, tech, I start something, I, I, I see that the MVP could be more minimal, you know, like it could be less. Um, and in Lanevera Roja, we didn't do an MVP. We just did a business plan and we, we believed that was going to happen. And we ended up having to raise uh, 10 million instead of 300,000. So it's a 30 times mistake. <laughs> not bad. Just that. Not bad. <laughs> not bad. That's a mistake, not bad. Any other question? Over there? And then, yes. Yeah. Um, I 
I'm not investing. I invest in in my co-founders, uh, Son Jose's fund, and that's it. Um, the situation is changing because there are entrepreneurs that have success that are starting to invest and that have been through the process of building something. And also because we are opening our startups to Europe, so we are South America, so we are we are starting to feel to think international. So if you think about the startups that that are like uh, cutting edge right now, like uh, or the best ones here, like Cabify or Japan Talent or whatever these these startups, they just think international. They they, they don't think about Spain. And the VCs are starting to also go. I mean, to have that that mindset and feel international and invest in companies that are outside Spain and. Uh, learn from other uh, VCs, uh, and they are composed by by um, by previous entrepreneurs, which makes things also uh, better for for investing because you've been there and you, you, you can understand the problems of the of the That's good. over there. The next 10 million. No. <laughs> um, well, definitely uh, building a, a team uh, uh, relying on, on a lot of incomes at the beginning, it's a, it's a huge mistake. But not because it keeps you from succeeding, but because it, it gets so much of your energy focused on things that you shouldn't focus on. Um, so trying to get the right people at the right time and so one, one huge mistake that we did is that we got into the we didn't have money and we didn't know that we could give a stock options. Nobody told us that we could give a stock options. Uh, so the, the pain was really low at that point. So nobody would like to come to, to, to La Nevera. So um, let's say that we, we were not too generous at that point. But because we didn't know. So uh, that was a mistake. We couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't get talent at the very end of of uh, of that era of what we had to say. Uh, in Ontrack, for example, everybody has stocks. Everybody. And that's the that's the way to get you know talent. Not only good talent, but also talent talent from abroad. You bring people from from UK, Germany, Russia. So. Out there. Well, you have to structure it. Uh, you, just, you have to be transparent. Uh, venture capital or, or investing in startups is uh, uh, it's, it's a binary game. You can, you can either multiply by 10 or you can either lose everything. You just have to be transparent with that. Uh, we, I'm, I'm confident that we, if we had lost everything, people would still be my friends. My family can help <laughs> avoiding being my family, but <laughs> my, my friends, I, I do think so. Uh, and also we were pretty cautious. I mean, we, we, were, we weren't like, give me all your money, give me all your savings. Like, give me what you can, what you need use it. That we might want to die by then, and it's going to be a good payback. Uh, but we might lose it, so don't give me the uh, money that you need for living. Did you need to I think this is. You. Yeah, that's true. But they, we had already competitors. They, oh, they, they have competitors. Yeah, and uh, my network is here. So for me, it fits here to start Europe. It's easy to bring talent in Europe. It's easy to get funds in Europe. It's so and. There's not a clear leader in Europe. There's, there's a clear leader in China, there's a clear leader in India, there's a clear leader in, in the United States. But Europe, is, there's no clear leader. So it was, it was, no, it just makes sense.
I'm writing down all those things that are going to happen later because I'm going to ask you again in a year. I think this is the last question. So I, I look for two main characteristics. First one, I look for people that, that have been through that before. So the CTO, it's former CTO of Delivery Hero and start, another startup, the um, uh, chief sales officer and operational officer, it's a former um, COO, at, I think it's a group on Brazil and Baidu and iContainer. So he's been through several startups, exits, uh, success, uh, some failure, and uh, product VP again. He, he started a startup, sold it, it was a success, then he built the startup, had to close it, it was a failure, so he's, he's been through many things. So everybody, so the good thing is that everybody understands when, when things are, are not going well, I know these people is not going to freak out. I know these people understand this can things happen, and we have to focus on what are the problems and work on them. And, and they already have been through this dynamic, so it's uh, easy to it's easier to communicate between us. We all understand the, the same logic of startups, uh, so that was one thing. And the second one, it's uh, humbleness. I, I wanted humble people. I think it's one. I think it's the key characteristic to build a successful team. Is that people is humble enough to uh, receive feedback from peers, uh, to give feedback on a good way, uh, not to feel upset when someone tells you that something is not working and. So, so those two things. Well, once again, give a very warm applause to you guys. Thanks a lot. <laughs>